Okay, so what we would do at the session, and for those that did attend the call one um, session, is a bit. It will be a bit of repetition today, but obviously we've got a lot of new faces, so important we go back over, back over everything. But we would obviously go be going talking through what the specifics of call two that we're launching today. So we will talk around the aims and objectives of the program, um, the different skills bootcamp models. We will, as I said, we'll talk. We'll open. We'll launch what's part. Of, you know what we're offering today as part of call two. Um, we'll touch upon the quality assurance processes that we do here at the Combined Authority and how we can support you with Ofsted. Um, we will talk through the learner eligibility for Skills Bootcamp, so you're clear on that. Um, importantly, we'll talk about how you will get paid if you are successful with your application, um, at what point you, points you receive that funding. Um, and then we will talk through, the sort of give you an overview of the specification documents and the application paperwork that will be going onto our website this afternoon. Um, there's some key takeaways I want to go through with you. So it's really important things to remember before you kind of write your bid. Um, a provisional timeline, so you've got a bit of an understanding of sort of obviously when you need to apply by and when we're likely to sort of, you're likely to receive that confirmation of whether you've been successful. And as I said, a question and answer session at the end. So first slide, Sherry, please. <clears throat> Yes, the main objective of the Skills Bootcamp programme is to address the needs of employers in our region and the wider economy. So through, if you do apply, that's what we're looking for, is looking for that you've identified a need that our employers have in this region and you're trying to feel, fill that need through the programme that you're offering. So the Skills Bootcamp's programme will deliver targeted interventions meeting, meeting the short to medium, medium term demand in this region. Um, Skills Boot Camps are about filling very much those sort of medium to higher level vacancies, sort of level three to level five. Um, that's where the training needs to be pitched at, sort of level three to level five. There are certain sectors um, where you can deliver at level two. Um, when you read the specifications that will go onto our website later today and you look at the specific lot and project, it will clearly outline whether that for that project, for that boot camp, we're looking at a you know, that level level three to five or whether it can be delivered at level two. So do read the specifications thoroughly. Um, so skills boot camps are all about supporting adults into new jobs to, or to take on new roles and responsibilities with their existing employers or to again obtain new work contracts if that's really for self-employed. So that's very much what the boot camps program is about. Um, boot camps should be no longer than 16 weeks in duration. That's very important. Um, they should be a minimum of 60 guided learning hours. So that's contact hours that the learner has with a tutor or mentor, for example. Um, important change for, um, for way five is that any digital courses now need to be 100 guided learning hours. Um, so, but don't worry too much. When you read the spec, it will make it very clear. Um, the number of guided learning hours that apply to that specific project. Um, so skills boot camps should are for adults age 19 plus, and they can be, and it's flexible, they can be for any self-employed, unemployed, people full time, working full-time, part-time, or those returning to work after a break. Um, this is really important. Um, skills boot camps do need to be flexible. So they need to be programs that deliver around existing commitments. So we will be looking for that in your bid that you're thinking about how can, so these learners are already working and have other commitments. How can we, how can, how can we adapt it so it works for them so they can attend and be successful in the program? So we'll, we'll be looking for things like blended sort of provision, sort of a mixture of face-to-face face-to-face -face and online or all online or you know whatever works really it's just about that flexibility some of our providers kind of think about it in terms of the hours that they deliver um so you know sort of part-time attendance perhaps evenings things like that anything that makes it flexible for, for people so they can attend um, next slide please so the skills boot camp model so um there's different different ways this can be modelled. So firstly, you could be an employer on this call today and you're looking to deliver the training yourself. Perhaps you have that capacity within your organisation to actually deliver the skills bootcamp yourself and we can fund you to do that. So it's sort of like CPD almost. So you've recognised 
as an organization that you've got um, skills gaps in your own company that you're struggling to fill. So you're through the skills boot camp, you're going to upskill your own employees. Um, some of our, we've already got um, employers that are doing this and doing this really successfully. Um, and some of them also open up spaces to external people to also come on to the training and at the end of it they offer them an um, interview with their organization so um that's that's one of the models um you could be a training provider on this call and looking to deliver a bespoke training solution for an employer so you've always linked up with an employer and they've got a skills need a skills gap and you're going to work with them to deliver a bespoke training solution for them perhaps you're going to deliver on site at their location or or you know you're going to bring the learners to your location whatever but you're working almost designing it in conjunction with that employer um, and that'd be where that sort of employer doesn't have that training capacity themselves. Um, or you could be a training provider and you're delivering a sort of a skills boot camp, almost a generic course that you're going to open up for a range of employees or the general public to attend. Um, it might be that you have like um, the first cohort, you've, you've got an employer that wants to put a whole cohort of learners on. So you might run a cohort just for that employer. Um, and then your second cohort might be open to anyone to apply from the general public. So um, pretty flexible, really. Um, one of the key things with skills boot camps is they must they are free to learners. That's a sort of key takeaway from today. So there's no charge ever to the learner. Um, but where training is bespoke for an employer or um, an employer is placing sort of an employee onto a skills boot camp to upskill them, the employer is expected to contribute. So it's a co-funded amount. So they'd be required to pay 10% of the cost per learner if they're an SME or 30% of the cost per learner if they're a large organisation. Okay, do you want to go to the next slide, Sherry? Thank you. Um, so today, so we're launching our second call. Um, so I'm just going to talk through the kind of lots and projects that are available today for you to apply for. So um, firstly, um, green skills. So we have um, we have a lot for upskilling to retrofit. So um, what we're looking for here is it's all about sort of upskilling kind of existing tradespeople to retrofit. So you may want to look at areas such as kind of air source, heat source, wall installation, solar, um, you know, it's quite broad, really. So, yeah, so you've got a project there, upskilling to retrofit. The maximum cost per learner for that one is £4,000. Um, across the green skills projects, which I'll talk through in a minute, we have um, we have £700,000 available. So, um, yeah, as I said, upskilling to retrofit is the first project. The second project under green skills is retrofit assessors, advisors, and coordinators. So this is obviously training people to give advice on domestic or commercial properties. Um, and we'd be looking at those skills boot camps to deliver sort of qualifications in assessing, advising, or coordinating. Again, 4,000, maximum cost per learner there of 4,000 pounds. Next slide, please. Okay, so, um, yeah, the third project under green skills is um, organisational sustainability. Um, with that one, the maximum cost per learner is £3,000. And this is all about sort of training, um, providing individuals with the skills to kind of advise on green strategies for organisational sustainability. Um, yeah, I mean, this is this we we already delivering some of these. They're fantastic. Organisations seem very willing to kind of put on members of staff within their organisation to learn these skills and take them back to their organisation. Um, under the organisational sustainability project, um, we are also including sort of waste management this time. So if that's an area you're looking to deliver in, um, do obviously read through that spec. Um, and our fourth project under green skills is um, construction and engineering. So any programs that kind of um, deliver sort of train people in green techniques linked to con construction and engineering. Um, again, there'll be more detail on the specification for that one. So do read that thoroughly. And that's again, £4,000 on that one maximum cost. Um, 
So the next project is we have one project under the lot construction in the built environment. Obviously, we had the green, there's construction within the green lot as well this year, but we do have an individual sort of project here under just construction, which is upskilling to poly competency. So this is all about taking sort of a tradesperson, kind of upskilling them. So they have like multi-trades almost, so training them in a, a new trade. Um, so yeah, that's £4,000 maximum per learner. And we have a total total funding available for upskilling to poly competency of one hundred and forty thousand um, pounds. We are launching again um, a lot in leadership and management. Um, recognise this is still a really kind of key key area where we we need more people with those skills. So we're looking for um, further skills boot camps, which um, deliver sort of leadership and management training, uh, perhaps with a sort of focus on project management. Um, and really that's all about sort of preparing organizations for things like the continuing like green revolution and, you know, digital changes in digital. So, so anything that's kind of, um, you know, in, upskilling our leaders really. So. £4,000 maximum cost per learner, and we have a funding pot of 250000 for leadership and management. Um, yeah, and then this one is slightly different. This is something new that we're kind of testing and learning in this call, and this is um, around the ra around rail. Um, so um, it's under the logistics se sector, and we're looking for any, any sort of skills boot camps that sort of... Um, um, deliver training in sort of track engineering or kind of operative side or maintenance. Um, this one's come about because there's, there is sort of, we know there's like major government um, investment in infrastructure and rail and, you know, we do, and we do need more, more skilled workers in the area. So around those kind of things like that sort of engineering side of rail, you know, operations side and that maintenance. So yeah, again, more detail, the specification that'll be online this afternoon. So do have to read about that um, and 120,000 pounds for that project. Next slide, please, Sherry. Okay, so our next lot um, is digital. So, um, we have £480,000 available across the digital projects. Um, so the first project is digital workplace skills. So this one is all about upskilling employees um, of bespoke projects. So there'll be boot camps that are either, so you could be an employer running this yourself, so you could be a training um, provider working with an employer, an employer that's recognised the need to upskill their staff. Um, you know, to something, this, there's just that need there in the organisation. So it's developing skills that support progression and or preparation for displacement through techno technological advances um, in the industry. So, um, yeah, so that one, yeah, the most important thing on that one is it is, it is just about upskilling employees, that one. So, um, um, and the next one is digital technical skills. So, this one, yeah, the digital workplace skills has a maximum cost per learner of 4,500. The digital technical skills is a bit higher. It's a maximum cost per learner of 6,000 um, pounds. Um, so this is really about those sort of more advanced digital skills and, you know, covers projects like sort of software development, data architecture, cloud technologies. Um, with all of these digital things, I did mention earlier, digital courses, did mention earlier, they do need to be 100 guided learning hours as a minimum. Um, yeah, so that's digital tech. And the last one on there, which is under digital, is um, sort of training around sort of computer-aided design, CAD, um, and building information modelling. So, um, yeah, so kind of boot camps that give people that training, they're sort of in the fundamentals of CAD and BIM. And it's five thousand pounds cost per learner on that one. Next slide, Sherry, please. Okay, so I just want to touch upon quality assurance and Ofsted. So, um, as many of you know on the call, um, from April last year, Ofsted started expect inspecting all providers of skills at boot camps. Um. Providers are inspected using the evaluation criteria that is set out in the Further Education and Skills Inspection Handbook. Um, so yeah, do have a read of that. The links to that will be available on our website. But broadly, um, what Ofsted 
what they're looking for is they're inspecting sort of the the intent of the boot camp, the implementation and the impact that it's having. Um, all new providers, they will receive an Ofsted monitoring visit within 18 months of starting delivery. Um, we have a, a number of our boot camps this year have already had their Ofsted monitoring visit. I mean, we, pleased to hear that most you know everybody has said it's been a positive experience so you know it's it's absolutely fine um it's something that we are very conscious of supporting our new providers with um we're very lucky to have um Stuart on our team he's a dedicated um quality assurance officer and he's out of, out and about working with our new providers kind of supporting them so they are ready for Ofsted so um yeah please don't worry about that um um, in addition, just to let you know, um, the Department for Education can come out and quality visit our skills boot camps. They tend to only really be doing that now if the provider also has a national contract. So, um, so if, because of that, it's very much to us now as the as the combined authority. So we do do our own quality visits. So we come, we come, we will come out once during the time you deliver. Um, and it's kind of a range of activities we do to sort of support you really. Um, so that would include we sort of do the annual monitoring visits. We'll kind of, um, um, we'll look at things like your schemes of work. We we always have regular progress meetings anyway. Um, we'll do evidence audits and things like that. Um, we'll be sort of, we will do, we will um, ask learners to complete satisfaction surveys. And that's really just to gauge how things are going and how we can further support you. Um, and in addition, as the combined authority, we do provide other sort of support through for Ofsted through sort of um, monitoring visit forums, which are really important. This is something we've newly introduced. This kind of brings together providers into a forum and we get... Um, we get kind of providers that have already been through the process to talk to other providers kind of about the experience and how it went with Ofsted and to support each other really. Um, we are, we're able to provide you with some key document templates and it's very much up to you to obviously put all your processes in place, but we can help with that. We do have some sort of templates we can provide you that will you know, obviously help you um, in setting up your program. Um, and we will, off the back of sort of these visits that we do, we will put together sort of development plans and work with you through them so that you feel like really ready for Ofsted when they when they do visit. And it says they're sort of connecting with other providers, which we think is obviously really important. Um, next slide, please, Sherry. So um, we wanted to go through with you sort of the learner eligibility today to make sure that's really clear. Um, so slightly different from some of the other programs we fund at the Combined Authority, it's that adults um, who, read, who enroll into this program can actually live outside our region, as long as they are enrolling with the intention to work within our region. It's something we will closely monitor with you, but yeah, the adult can, they can live outside of the region, but it's all about, you know, you having those conversations and being assured that they're, you know, they're looking for you to support them to gain a job in this region. Um, so um, it says there the LEP geographical area. So just so you know, that includes sort of North Somerset. So North Somerset, Bath and North East Somerset, South Gloucestershire and Bristol. So um, yeah, so they can live outside the region, but they have to be looking for work within the region. Um, it's available to all adults aged 19 or over. Um, it's slightly different depending on your boot camp starts, but don't worry too much. That will all be in sort of your funding guidelines and things. So it depends on the date, the start date of your boot camp, whether you look at whether they 19 the um, August before or this August. So, but that'll all be in the rules. So don't worry too much about that. Um, learners must have the right to work in the UK. Um, they must meet residency requirements and you must not actively recruit learners that live outside of England. Next slide, please. So um, payment milestones, I'm sure you want to know how this works. So um, if you are successful with your application and you are given that sort of grant offer, um, you will get paid on results basically. So um, the first payment we will make to you, which is 40% of the cost per learner. That'll be paid to you once, you're, once a learner has completed 14 qualifying days and a minimum and it has a minimum of 10 guided learning hours, that's 10 contact hours. 
Um, by 14 qualifying days, it's just a case of counting day one of the course, um, counting on 14 days from day one. And if they still and if they haven't dropped out, then you'll be able to claim claim that 40 percent. You will notice for existing providers, you will notice that for wave five, the payments are structured slightly differently. And that's very much been kind of driven by the Department for Education. So there's slightly sort of slightly less on that first and second payment and slightly more on that third kind of payment. Um, so, so first payment, like I said, completion of 14 qualifying days, second payment of 30%, you will be paid once the learner completes all aspects of the training and they receive an offer of an interview or equivalent. So um, the inter base, the, when you're designing your school's boot camp, you need to think of that the interview has always been part of the completion. The learner hasn't really completed till they've had that guaranteed interview. Um, so you're going to set that up for them in your design. You'll be thinking ahead of, you know, um, how you're going to get these interviews for these learners. It says equivalent because if they're self-employed, an interview probably won't apply. So there's some equivalence that you could provide for that. The self-employed about developing an action plan with them of how they will secure new work contracts. And also for those that are kind of on the training, because they're being upskilled by their current employer, an interview again may not apply. So what we'll be looking there is for them evidence that have been offered a new responsibility within, within that um, organization. And the third and final payment of 30% is paid on its successful outcome. So a positive progression. So um, a successful outcome, positive progression will be that um that the learner now has a new role using the skills, or has now been offered a new role using the skills gained. If they're self-employed, they've obtained a new work contract using the skills they've gained, or if they're, they won the course because their employer was upskilling them, that they now have that new responsibility or role within their current organisation. Next slide, please, Sherry. So specifications, so um, when you go on, so later on today, I'm not sure if they're on there yet, when you go onto our website, um, you will find all the specifications and there's one per lot. Um, and then within each specification, it has like within that lot, it will have the individual projects within it. Um, yeah, obviously do read these thoroughly before you complete your application for funding. That's really important. Um, so within the specification, it will detail the projects that you can apply for. It will confirm the funding amounts available that we've talked through today. It will give you the sort of application and closing date time and how to submit your application. And it will give you a real detailed objectives of each project. You can really understand what you what we're looking for here. So it's important when you apply to make sure you are meeting the objectives of the project and it will give other general information like around eligibility and how we manage performance and things like that. Um, as it says there, they will be available definitely by five o'clock today on the website. Um, Sherry or Emily, could you put the link in to the chat when you get a chance, please? Just so that everyone on the call knows to where to go and look for the for the documentation this afternoon. Um, yeah, I'm not sure. Hopefully it'll be on very soon, if not already, but definitely by five o'clock today. Um, next slide, please. Okay, so once you've read through the specification, you understand what you're looking for. If you're interested in applying, um, do go on and find the application form that will be on the website. So um, in the application form, it will outline the evaluation and assessment process that we follow. Um, and it will clearly outline all the documents and sort of supporting evidence that you need to complete and submit in order to apply. Um, to give you an understanding of the types of questions that are in the application form. So um, there's firstly, there's a question on there around project planning. So that's so you'll be asked to kind of consider like the project design and um, the impact from previous skills boot camps delivery you've done so you will or any other similar provisions so you will be asked to kind of share what you've done previously um you know the successes the learnings from that um you will be able to you'll be asked to um create a curriculum plan that is actually a separate appendix it'll be very clear when you go onto our website there's a separate kind of document you need to fill in which is your curriculum plan so um yeah so you'll be asked to kind of 
week kind of week by week we obviously understand that things can tweak as we go along but kind of we do need to kind of a high level understanding of what the curriculum involves um what you'll you'll be asked what your plan is for employability skills training because um that forms a key part of the skills boot camp um you'll have to fill out a project delivery plan so um you know all the different milestones in order to deliver so from like the point you market your program your project to when your first cohort will run and things like that um and you'll be asked to identify any kind of risks and issues on what mitigations you will put in place um there's a question around value for money um with that one you will be asked to complete a separate document called the financial annex again you'll find that on the website it'll be very clear all these you know where the main application form is and these sort of appendices that you need to fill in so the financial annex is on there it's an excel spreadsheet you will be asked on there to break down the costs of delivering the project so it starts at that point so how much is it going to cost you to deliver this project um, from you know including costs for marketing venue hire tutors everything really so you'll pop that all in there you'll break that down and then and then you'll sh through that form, it will show us how much the cost is per learner. You need to make sure that you're not exceeding that maximum that's stated in the specification. Um, and through that, you'll also have to sort of um, have a plan for how many learners, who you're targeting, really. So how many of those will have that sort of 10 percent or 30 percent mandatory contribution from the employer and how many be sort of independent learners where they get 100 percent funding from us? Um, and there will be a sort of question within there asking you to sort of benchmark your costs against other um, other similar provision in the market. Um, there's an employer engagement question. This is really important because, um, you know, it's all about working with employers. This program It's all about filling the needs that the employers have. So we will be asking you about the employers that you've engaged with in your project and how they are engaged. Are they sort of are they involved in the sort of have they been involved in the design of the program? Are they going to be involved in the delivery? Perhaps they're going to run workshops. Um, perhaps they are going to sort of, you know, they've already said, actually, yeah, we will offer we will we'll work with you to offer interviews for these learners. So we'll be asking you to kind of outline the employee engagement um, that you've done um, and how those those companies are involved. Um, and we will also be looking for letters of support from the employers. So do you bear that in mind? It's, it's very clear on the application form. Um, so any employers you do list on there as involved in your programme, you will need to also get sort of a letter of support from them and upload that alongside your application form. Um, learner enrolment. So there'll be a question there all around sort of your approach to learner enrolment. So how are you going to market your skills boot camp? How are you going to engage those underrepresented groups? And very key, what is your initial assessment process going to look like to make sure you do get the sort of the right learners onto the course to make sure it is the right thing for them um, and that they can be successful. Next slide, please, Sherry. Yeah, so there's a question around learner support, obviously still obviously very key as well. So um, how are you going to continue to support these learners once they're on the boot camp to make sure they, uh, to enable that meaningful progression um, how are you going to support learners if they leave or if you find that this course isn't suitable for them? You know, it's very key if we're funding this, we want to make sure that the, it's all about the residents, it's all about the learners, um, making sure that they um, are signposted onto other provision that may be suitable or other support. And how are you going to support learners if there's a, a change in circumstances whilst they're on the training? Um, You'll be asked a, um, a question around learner progression. Um, so what are the progression outcomes for this skills boot camp? So um, if you're designing a skills boot camp, we expect you would have thought through what is the end point for them? What are these job roles that they'll move into? So you'll need to kind of like clearly outline what those outcomes are. Um, how you ensure that they get those guaranteed interviews that we talked about. So we mentioned that actually they're not they haven't really completed the training so they've had that interview so how are you going to ensure those learners get those interviews and how are you going to maintain learner engagement after they finish your training a part of this part of this program so it's not just a, it won't it's not just about delivering the training it's also about working with those learners once they finish the training to get them into employment so it's that how you you know it's 
very important to have a good engagement strategy of once they finish your training, how are you going to keep working with those learners? How are you going to keep contact with them so you can support them to ensure that within they have six months effectively to get into a role? So, yeah, it's that six month period after training completes. How will you work with them and ensure that they they move on into a role using the skills gained? Um, you will be asked around your quality um, quality of provision. So what are your quality assurance processes or what processes will you be putting in place and how you, how will you ensure continuous improvement? So how will you learn from things and continually develop? And there's also a question around sort of data collection that's in there because there is quite a lot of data that we need to collect on this program by our learners and employers. Uh, there's nothing to worry about. It's just more about sort of just understanding that they, you know, that is a requirement. So we will be asking about how you sort of coordinate the data and evidence collection um, from learners and employers and how you ensure like the accuracy of the data you submit to us. Um, as mentioned, it's just a note there about the financial annex and the curriculum plan being a separate appendix. So to the main application form. So just to bear that in mind, but it will be very clear on our website. So don't worry. And as I said, in the application form, it's got a tick list. So you can you'll you'll be certain that you filled everything in before you submit it. Um, yeah, and just one more note, just to say that any sort of statements or claims that you make in your application, make sure there can be sort of evidence. So as you're when you're writing it, make sure you're kind of evidencing what you're saying in there, if that makes sense. Um, and all the application paperwork should be on our website by, well, it will be on our website by five o'clock today. It's there now, Bryony. Oh, it's there. Fantastic. So it's there already, which is great. So you'll be able to go on straight after this call and have a look at that. Next slide, please, Sherry. So, um, yeah, just a few key takeaways. So um, things to remember. So it's Skills Bootcamp's so employer centric. That's the key. So that must run through your bid, you know, that it is based on what the employers need in our region. Um, training is always free to learners. So just remember that. And employers must contribute um, either 10 percent of the cost per learner for an SME or 30 percent if they're a large organisation. Um, a reminder that training must be no longer than 16 weeks, um, must be made up of a minimum of 60 guided learning hours, contact hours, and 100 guided learning hours if it's a digital course. And as I mentioned before, the spec will make it very clear if it's been categorised as a digital course. So do you read the spec? Um, applications should be well evidenced with a clear need identified. Um, we are looking for applications to offer value for money. So do bear that in mind. Um, and applications should be able to demonstrate impact and learnings from previous skills bootcamp delivery or other similar provision. So obviously think about that when you're writing your bid, really thinking about what you've learned from previous delivery and how you're sort of adapting, you know, your th this particular skills bootcamp you're applying for. Um, as mentioned, you will be required to submit letters of support from employers. So be mindful of that. Um, and yeah, the, that learner support is vital. So there's obviously quite a few question, bits within questions in the application around that. So not only support for the learners that are on the training, but also those who withdraw or those that have found the book that you find where this this particular boot camp is not um, suitable for them. Um, um, just a reminder there that, yeah, it's the provider's responsibility to ensure that the learners who self-refer onto the programme receive a guaranteed interview for a new role with a new new employer in the region. So that's very key. And a final note, to not underestimate the administrat administrative process. So when you are putting your project together and you're looking at kind of costs and things like that just don't underestimate there is a, there's a fair bit of admin involved in this we were we are up, we've got a fantastic team that are really supportive but you know we, there are there are a fair few requirements around sort of data submissions and evidencing so just do yeah bear in mind the need to make sure you put in that sufficient um resource around sort of that admin side um next slide please sherry Okay, and 
yeah and finally i think this is nearly at the end um so to give you an, an idea of the sort of timeline so obviously we're launching today we're launching now application paperwork and specs are on the website now we will close on the 8th of april that's noon on the 8th of april so you've actually got four weeks to apply um and then as soon as the applications are all in we go straight into our sort of bid assessment process where our independent assessment panel review them all um you know moderation meetings are held and we think the funding decisions should um be made and approved around the 17th of may it can take because of some of the internal processes the review process the assessment process can take a while if we need to go out for clarifications we'll have to factor that in so if there's any sort of if you are um success you know if we think your application does get recommended perhaps there's a couple of areas of clarification we'd be going back to you on those so but we're thinking around 17th of may um funding decisions will be approved um once they um once we get a funding decision whether that's sort of that you've been approved or whether unfortunately you haven't you will get notified so then you can obviously start start planning ahead then um contracts will likely go out um sort of the end of the month they can take a little bit of time from approval to actually get them sort of ready and signed off internally so we think those will go out sort of end of may um and then you have a few weeks to return them so what we're planning for is that for this second call here that provision you'd be looking for a provision to start around the beginning of june obviously it can start later than that but the earliest is likely to be beginning of june um next slide please and that's about it really so that's just um the link to the website i think we put into the chat anyway so um let's share if you wanted to kind of take down the presentation and then um Myself and my colleague Sherry, we're going to have a look through the chat, I think, and see if we've got any questions. Yeah, we've got a few questions um, here. So what we'll do is just start at the very first one and then work our way through. Um, so, so go back to talk back to the top. Um, so the first question is from Harry Reid, and it's can employer providers provide skills boot camps? for other perhaps smaller employers at all? And the answer to that is yes, <laughs> most definitely. Um, I don't know if you want to add to that, Bryony, but yeah, we really do yeah, that as well as much as possible because we appreciate that a larger employer will have the capacity to be able to, a better capacity to be able to manage that fund funding um, and then can um, let that out through and, and, and encourage enrollments from other smaller businesses. Um, in the same field. So yes, there's a very short answer to that one. Um, this is another one now from Richard Brown, and it says, where there is a demonstrated sector need for a boot camp, but due to key employers being publicly funded, they are unable to fund the 10% or 30% contribution. Will Weka waive the employer contribution or consider doing this on a case by case basis. Um, so the direction we've had from the DfE is that the ten percent and thirty percent is always mandatory. We've, um, yeah, there's no, there's it, it, it is mandatory. Um, any any employer, whoever they are, would have to pay the ten percent or thirty percent contribution. Yeah, the only time that that contribution doesn't apply is for when people are purely self-employed or freelance. Yeah, so if you're self-employed, yeah, you there's no contribution. If you're individual freelance, like um, Sherry said, but yeah, it is. It's a you know, there's not been any. We've referred cases before to DfE. There haven't been any sort of budge on that. It is there is an expect that expectation there that the ten percent or thirty percent is paid paid by any employer who you know irrelevant of this kind of sector that they're in. Okay, Christian asks, may I ask if the maximum cost is pre or post tax? And what is the relation of cost to guided learning hours? For example, on 6,000, what is the minimum expected guided learning hours? Um, there's no, in terms of, I start with the guided learning hours. In terms of guided learning hours, the only minimum is, the only set minimum is what we talked about was the sort of, 
60 guided learning hours for non-digital training or 100 guided learning hours for um for sort of you know that digital training so that is the only minimums but obviously we're, what we would be looking for is if you do go for like the higher we would when your bid is reviewed and the curriculum plan is reviewed we will be we'll obviously be looking at a whole to make sure it's value for money there's you know to make sure for what the cost that we're paying that it actually but we obviously understand that there's wider thing you know it's not always just the guided learning as it's costs it's other bits and pieces so um yeah there's a, the only minimums are the 60 guided learning as or 100 for digital that we set so it's just about very much sort of you know but you obviously will be asked to break down those costs and what that sort of what that cost per if you if you are do go for the maximum what is what is what that is being used for and obviously if it is um you know tutor time significant that we expect to see the curriculum plan more guided learning hours um yeah it's yeah but it's no yeah. there's no set other than that um and your other question what was the other part of the question the about? other part of the question was may i ask if the maximum cost is pre or post tax um i'm not sure i'd need to get back to you on that we can we can um we'll make um unless you have the answer sherry we can put it we'll make sure we get a clear answer for you on that through our faq document okay next one is are you from Anne stanley are you adding digital marketing into future calls um we're not sure at the moment at the moment it isn't in scope but it's something um it's not to say it won't be um at the moment it isn't that's all we can say if, if we do if it if it does come back in in wave five, um, we will obviously let you know as soon as as soon as we do. Um, we don't know at the moment whether there will be a um, call three. There very much well might be. It's um, but yeah, we will. But as soon as we know, we'll let you know if digital marketing is kind of um, deemed to be back in as deemed to be a key um, area this year. But at the moment, yeah, it hasn't been part of call one or call two. So that's all I can say really at this stage. Um, not the moment, but we we will let you know. Okay, next one is from James Adams at Tech Educators, and he's asked, do you prefer providers with a location in area? For example, we would look to partner our bid with a three digital hubs across the region. Um, no, so we're not, um, providers can be based, they can be based anywhere really. So it's not, um, but we're just, we'd be looking you to evidence in your bid about the kind of like the connections you have with this region. So. Yeah, we do have a number of providers that are not in region that we're funding now, but they're very much kind of able to evidence they've been able to set up this sort of presence in our region and really show us that they're kind of they, you know, they're working here. They have sort of employees here based in the region or they're sort of. So, yeah, the hub idea sounds great. So it's all about it's not it, we don't it, it doesn't matter where you're based, but you do need to evidence through your bid that you uh, you know, have those links with our region and that it's sort of. You, you you will have that presence here and that kind of understanding of the employer's need here. So just bear that in mind. The next one is not necessarily a question and it's an apology from us, I think. Um, the specification for digital references actually 60 guided learning hours on pages seven, nine and 11. However, we're clear that it is 100 guided learning hours. Um, whilst we've been on the call, Emily has contacted Stuart, so we'll get that updated and on the website ASAP. So apologies for that. Um, and then we've got digital across all areas has moved to 100 guided learning hours nationally or if delivering locally only local councils, MCAs, et cetera. Most intensive courses sit at 400 guided learning hours. That's more of a comment. Is there any digital marketing or AI focused lots? Um, You've already mentioned the fact that digital marketing in itself is not covered at the moment. Yeah, it's not. But do have I think is it worth having? We did. Um, we do. Ha we do have an open lot at the moment called Creative Digital. It was actually part of our first call. Um, it might be worth having a look at the specification for that one. It is on our website at the moment, just to see if what you're thinking might fit within that. Is that worth saying, Sherry? Um, I think we yeah. you've got a couple of weeks. That one closes on what date is it? Twenty. It's only a couple of weeks. It closes on the twenty fifth yeah. of March. If you go onto our website, um, and look at Creative Digital, there's a project lot open at the but moment. But there is also open. there is possibly also scope under Digital Workplace Skills in that what were 
look if, if you've got somebody that's already working in a digital marketing space that needs to upskill in AI then you know there could possibly be um, yeah. digital workplace skills yeah do have um, a look maybe. at that one yeah that's the one that's around sort of working for a bespoke project for a company yeah. so but you know if you have a company that you know an employer that's there that needs these individuals to have this AI skill you know wants you to run a, like, like a cohort of employees to you know do you have a look at that one like sherry says yeah. the workplace skills one but in Thanks. within digital marketing as well we know that there's been talk of upskilling people within digital marketing already with regards to like tv and film skills and editing skills for marketing purposes so that like like brian has already covered that will be covered under the creative digital um element that's already um like we said launched a couple of weeks ago um Conscious of time, so I'll crack on. Um, then, would you please be able to share the link for the first call? Thank you very much. Everything is, Sophie, everything is on the same page for the first call. So um, if you look, it's very clear on the web page that call one, the dates it closes, call two, the dates that closes, and then all the relevant documents are already on there and actually a copy of the slide deck that Bryony has just presented to you is also on that same web page that I've already provided the link for. Um, and it says, I've had a look on the website and both call one and call two application forms list the same project application. Hmm. Okay, we'll right. have a look at that then. <laughs> I think what's happened, everything's gone on when we've been on the call, so we haven't had, let's just... Yeah, we haven't had a chance to look at it. Sure yeah. immediately check that that's not duplicated. Um, so then at Bristol Together, Paul Morgan at Bristol Together says, as a CIC, we have very minimal duplication of skills at management level, making us very vulnerable. If one member of the management team left was off sick, for a long period, would we be able to use a skills bootcamp to upskill each level of management so they would need they would be able to step up if needed? How do we then show a positive outcome at the end? Can you repeat that, um, Sherry? Just so it, the, the first bit is as a CIC, they, they're very vulnerable because they have very minimal duplication of skills at their management level. Um, particularly if someone's off sick or they leave, um, if off sick for a long period or leave, would they be able to use the skills boot camp to upskill each level of management so they would be able to step up if needed? How do we then show a positive outcome at the end? Um, I don't know, don't know whoever's asked that question might want to quickly kind of come onto the call. It might be easier. I'm not quite quite clear on the question. Only if you're happy to. If not, we can pick up afterwards. It's fine. Yeah. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Effectively, we've got our management team, um, but we obviously need to have people in place if someone did leave or was off sick for a long period of time. Um, we do a lot of skills training on site with ex-offenders uh, in okay. construction uh, anyway. So it's more around the basis of can we... If we train our managers to be able to step up if someone else leaves or is off, how do we show a positive outcome? Because they won't be getting offered a new job. They'll simply be ready to step into that position if needed. Oh, so you're looking to use the boot camp to train people so they're ready to step in. Is that what you're... Exactly, yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, it's an interesting one. I guess if they... Yeah, I mean, I guess that's okay as long as you can like to that you're what you're training them for is to take on a new responsibility of being able to have that always that deputy role. Does that make sense? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Potentially, yeah. Um, probably need to look at it a bit further. Is it worth us picking up afterwards? Maybe I think perhaps, and we'll. Yeah. Um, yeah. Perfect. Let's do that. Um, if you get contact details, Sherry, we can. We can catch up afterwards and kind yeah, of yeah. I've got those. A bit I've, further, yeah, I've got those from the registration, so um, I can get those to you definitely. Um, and I just want to check because I think one new. Um, right. So James Adams has said we are working with an education partner 
that will finally do an accelerated apprenticeship in software development. Would we be able to reference that in call two as it won't be ready for call one and is envisaged envisioned funding for that reopen in later calls? So is this a path or are you are you looking were you interested? They're working, in they're actually working with an education partner to do an accelerated apprenticeship in software development, but they're not yet ready for this within um within this call. Um so are there is it planned for future rounds of funding, which I we can't actually 100 percent say at the moment, um, because we don't know what um if any underspend there will be. So to the, then actually warrant that call three so it's a bit of a vague answer but not at the moment we can't tell we cannot tell you but as soon as we do know um then we will be able to make that public knowledge um, and that is the end of the questions did anyone else have anything else they wanted to ask if so if pop it into the chat now um Or if not, just to let you know, all of the um, all of the questions you've asked today, we will pop into the. There's an FAQ document on our website, so any questions you've asked and answers we've given will be on there. If there's any questions that we said we follow up, we will do. Um, um, and anyone we said, obviously, we'd follow follow up with directly. Um, during the when when we are open, so this next four weeks do just drop us an email with any questions you have at all. So as you're kind of build, putting together your application, do answer, do do ask us, we can help. We we do have to publish everything that's asked, obviously not with your names, but we will obviously, we have to make sure that everyone gets the same information. So if you do ask a question during the next four weeks, we will do, yeah, we will help you as best we can. And then we'll obviously publish that onto the FAQ so everyone gets that information. Um, so is there anything else, Sherry? Any last minute questions? Well, um, is there a maximum number of applications that can be sent? No, there's no maximum. So you can, yeah, send in as many as you want. That's absolutely fine. Obviously, just kind of mindful of, you know, how much funding is available and things. But yeah, there's no no limit to how many you apply for or how many lots or projects you apply for. That's no problem. So that's it. Thank you very much, Brian. I'm going to stop the recording now. Thank you, Sherry. And thank you, everyone, for attending today. As I said, please